We're good. Hi there, Suzanne. That's us live. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. You're welcome. No problem at all. So um, for viewers that may not be uh, totally familiar with you, Suzanne, or I'm, I'm sure people will be, but maybe you could start with a little bit of background on yourself, if you don't mind. Well, let's see. My mother claims that I learned to speak English so that I could ask for a pony. So this is um, this is a lifelong adventure for me. The The focus always has been animals, animals, animals. Um, so that's all I've done my whole life, with the exception of a two-day stint where I was a secretary, and that, that didn't go well. Um, so horses are my first love, dogs are my second love, but I didn't have the money to become a horse trainer, so I became a dog trainer who had horses. That was easier. Um, it, very rewarding. I, I love what I do, and I'm always in search of more, more knowledge, more understanding. How do I how do I get to a better spot with each animal? How do I understand them more quickly, more thoroughly? And then the older I get, the less I do formal training and the more I'm really interested in the quality of the relationship and, and connection. So that's, that's, that's become the foundation of my work for a very long time, which is people would bring me dogs with problems, right? And then I think, well, actually the, the issue is the foundation is the relationship itself. So then I just, I started just keeping the relationship central to everything. And so that's all my choices are made from equipment to methodology to techniques. How does this affect the relationship? If it supports the relationship, we're good to go. So I, I just began calling it relationship centered. Actually, I called it relationship based training, but so many people stole that, that I gave up and <laughs> I tried one more time to claim a name for me. So relationship centered training is what we call it. Great stuff and such a good name for it too. But you, you've been in the field of dog training for, for a while, is that fair to say, uh, Suzanne? A while. Aren't you kind, sir? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so the well, the first time I got paid to do anything with a dog, I was eight years old and that, that amazed me. I was going to do it all for free anyway and then they gave me a quarter. But that that's never been my motivation was money. But yes, I've been working professionally with dogs and horses since 1977. So you do the wow. math. Wow. Hey, how long? <laughs> and the sector must have changed dramatically since then. You must have seen the sector evolve quite significantly Absolutely. since then. Yeah. Absolutely, because in the in those days it was all keeler. You know, it was all jerk and holler. And to say that that cannot be done effectively uh, that is crazy. It, it's not that the world was full of you know, dogs that were cowering in fear. It's just that as we moved on, we find new ways to do things. So I was very lucky to be taken under the wing of Jack and Wendy Volhard when I was just 21. They picked me out of a crowd. I didn't even have a dog at the time. And I went to a dog training instructor's week-long workshop, like a lunatic, you know, with money I didn't have, really. And something about me, Jack said later, he said, well, whatever it is, you had it. I was like, okay. But... I like their motivational approach. How do we how do we try to encourage the dog to do what we would like him to do? How do we how do we get that going? So I eventually did move away from them, but I was I was really blessed because Wendy used to be a, a research journalist. So she was very thorough in her research. Jack was a um, a judge, so a lawyer, and very both of them unbelievably intelligent, very well organized. And so they took this crazy kid who's like, I want to know why. They're like, well, all right, come with us. And here's our library. And come stay with us and work with us and ask all the questions you want. Um, and so that was absolutely invaluable. Absolutely invaluable. Um, and I just began shifting, looking for better ways, better ways. And then when I met Linda Tellington Jones, that was, that was like, oh, there we go. That was the missing piece I was after. There are other ways to do this. Um, do it without using much force at all, you know, really, really working with the animal cooperatively. So, sure. And you have dogs yourself, yeah, Suzanne? Oh, my God, yes. In fact, <laughs> in fact, I'm going to put you on hold for one second because my old dog is going to take the door apart. And she's going to, I can't tell at her. I knew I shouldn't have left her outside. All right, all right. Let's go. Come on. Here you go. Even as I left her outside, I thought I probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> okay, we're back. Okay. She's 13 and a half, and 
well, not happy about being left outside on a hot day. Can't blame her. What, what breed, Sonora? Uh, German Shepherd. So I breed German Shepherd. So we've got seven of them. Wow. And uh, we're waiting on generation number 11 to be born. Wow. So that's a long time breeding. Breeding dogs. Yep. Breeding. I've also bred Britneys for five years. I did that briefly. And then I've, I've lived with and, um, you know, shared life with Scottish Deerhound, Greyhound, Boxer, Mini Poodle, Lab Chow Crosses. I'm trying to think what else. Goldens, Pointers. I don't know, Brits, Shelties, love my little Sheltie. Yeah, but my first my first great love is the German Shepherd. Mm -hmm. See, likewise. Yeah, oh, yeah, shepherd. see, good yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I love German Shepherds, fantastic. Nothing else like them. Mm -hmm. For sure. And, and I guess when you when you first um, started training, you mentioned that it was more focused on kind of traditional techniques of, of training dogs. And, and you'd be glad to have seen that evolve beyond those techniques. And you mentioned oh, yeah. your relationship-centered point of view. Did you feel when those techniques were being used that it was having a negative impact in the relationship between the handler and, and their dog? I think, I think the answer was yes and no. I mean, you know, it, it, it's the reality is if you're if you're using things consistently and well. I mean, one of the things that I how I became a you know professional horse person was I was very good at applying corrections. And the horses still liked me. They understood what I was asking. They understood the information. They moved on. They, they were not afraid of me or reluctant to work. And the same was true with dogs. But what I didn't like was that how I messed around with dogs when I was just teaching them stuff. Like, no one told me that a dog couldn't climb the playground slide, which was, what, 10 feet high? You know, so I just thought, of course the collie can learn that. And... We had a little electric car that had no battery, and that was back when macrame was very, like, that was what you did in art class. But all the other children were making their mothers, like, plant hangers, and I macrame an entire driving harness for my dog, and I hooked this collie up to this little electric car that had no battery, and I drove him all over town. So long before karting was a sport, I had a dog that I could drive all over town, walk, trot, canter, stop, back, turn, left, right. Yeah, that was... So how I worked with him was different then than when I was doing obedience. So when I went to obedience class and it was like, you have to do this to correct him. Whereas if I was teaching him fun stuff or tricks, it was like, nope, try again, dude. Nope, try again. Wait, that wasn't right. Yep, you got it. So I thought, why are these so different? And the same thing with my horses. Why in a formal dressage lesson am I so unhappy? And yet if I'm out mucking around doing something else with my horses it's a different quality as like one is like i'm having a relationship and a friendship and a conversation the other is i'm training like i don't like training <laughs> training is not fun um and so i could just see the difference i could see the light in their eyes when i was conversational and being really responsive and respectful Versus, I'm going to show you what to do, and you will do it, or else. And how dare you try to get away with it? So, I was I was a weird little pioneer that no one's like, what is she doing? Like what? Someone even told my husband before he met me. He came with his uh, police dog. He had an old golden retriever police unit, and so one of his dogs was really just melting down. She was becoming quite dysfunctional. And they said, well, you should probably go to that seminar. And he says, well, what is it she does? He's like, I don't know. She does guru stuff. Like we don't know what it is. Like, what, what is that? But now everybody's like, oh, yes, relationship. I'm like, okay. But back in the 90s, early 90s, no, I was way out there. Mm -hmm. And I guess if you were feeling that way, there's a good chance that the dogs were feeling that way too. If you weren't enjoying <laughs> going to training, there's a good chance they weren't either. Is, it, is that fair to say? Oh, yeah. And I remember, I remember throwing a dumbbell once over a high jump for my big boy. And, uh, yeah, he, he takes the jump, gets the dumbbell. And he walks off and he goes and lays on the porch. And I was like, you need to come back here and finish that exercise. He's like, nope. <laughs> just, no. Just no. Done with you. You're an idiot. I was like, how dare you? I was like, I was like 23, 24. So you're really stupid then. But yeah, no, I've, I've come a long way since then. The animals have taught me a lot. And every time I, I think the advice Linda Tellington Jones gave me, like that was early 90s. I met her. And we were, we were at lunchtime and it's the last day of the workshop. And I said, so is there any advice you could give me? Like how to be a better 
trainer, how to be better with animals. I can still see her. She has like a little fork full of potato salad. She's like, hmm, learn to train without ego. And it was like someone shot an arrow in my heart. I never took the arrow out. So every now and then I'll flick it myself just to remind me. But animals are really good at saying, oh, remember what she said? Like, yeah, don't go there. So those those growls or that slightly pinned ear says, hmm, careful girl. I <laughs> Knock on wood, I haven't heard that in a long time. But, uh, yeah, I could be wrong at any moment in, on, on the planet. It's, it's such a good way of looking at it to remain objective, isn't it? To remove the ego from the training process. It's a skill, um, one that's acquired and learned as you go through your own evolution and journey as a, as a, as a trainer or behaviorist. Um, but what a fantastic way of looking at it is to try and remove that ego from it. But no easy task, um, for sure. It's been, it's been interesting because in teaching seminars all around the world, what people do is present their dogs. So I'm now you know, on the floor in front of the whole audience and people expect me to do something magical. And so I'm always, I'm always amused because that is where I have almost no ego and I really don't care. Like, it's like, so I will do what the dog says needs doing. Um, and it's, it's just amusing to me. It's just me and the dog in this nice space. And it's like, let's see where we can go to. Um, whether the people are impressed or not, it's just, I don't know. That's what you paid to see. You paid to see me. I had someone once asked, like, do you, they were quite angry after a seminar. They said, do you ever actually handle real aggression cases? Because nothing really happened during this workshop. And I thought, well, real aggression cases? You mean like where I, I provoke the dog so we can see how bad he is and then he almost bites me and then I fix him? It's like, no, I don't ever teach those. It looks like paint drying, toast turning brown. That's my favorite. Does it look like toast turning brown? Is it that exciting? That's good training. Um, and I said, well, the Roddy that you were so not impressed by had bitten six people. Six people. And she'd gone through two, you know, gates and a window to get to two of them. Uh, I was like, no, no, no. I, I don't want her to go there. I was successful because I didn't go there. And she walked away thinking, ah, that was okay. It's like, all right, that's my goal. So it's uh yeah, learning to train without ego. If you <laughs> if you have any sense, the dogs will actually warn you. There you go again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't get all cocky now. Mm -hmm. It's so nice to listen as well to the if they're communicating that we need to listen to them. I think you made such a good point there that sometimes what we are doing is not glamorous and, and it should be routine and boring and we don't want to see I see I see a label of problem behaviour, right? I don't want to see aggressive behaviour from a dog that I'm working with if I am I'm doing something wrong is that, is that fair yeah and and why would i want the dog and people say well you're being so nice and quiet if you were to run up and like try to grab his head but why would i do that <laughs> also you told me that he'd bitten four people i believe you i do not like getting bit why would i why would i even put myself at risk never mind why would i do that to your dog and yet i've encountered trainers one very famous one years ago, he, he would tell the clients, I have to take the bite so that I know what kind of a, aggression it is. He was very proud of all of his scars. And I thought, oh, just you should work with bigger animals that could maybe just take you out completely <laughs> instead of leaving you bleed. Yeah, good thing you don't work with horses, mister. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, it is such a good point because I think sometimes when you're working with a, with a client, they have a preconceived idea about you coming in and doing something magical with their dog is very visual and has that impact. And when you make it very boring and routine, it almost falls below that expectation because you're not seeing, if it is say aggressive behavior, you're not seeing that aggressive behavior d deliberately and skillfully so. Um, so yeah. yeah, and I think, I think television has a, a part to play in that, that we've set up these big dynamics that it's all gonna be dramatic and then magically fixed and all the skillful trainers I know look at that and they think that you're doing it wrong. <laughs> it would be like a chef who comes in and sets the entire dish on fire and then tells you how to rescue it now that you've burnt it, you know, like, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, Dump. it's TV shows and society in general, right, Suzanne, that we want kind of quick fixes, you know, we want things solved and fixed. And, and when we work with, with dogs in particular, you know, that may not be possible 
you know, to, to resolve a situation. We manage, we prevent, we put measures in place, and, and that's all great. But there's maybe an expectation that we will transform their dog from what it is just now into this, you know, well-socialized animal. And for some dogs, that's just not possible, right? No, it's, it's not possible. We always, and this is where I think um, positive training is, is just as much to, to blame as, as any negative-based training or correction-based training in that, there's a there's a mindset, and this comes out of Skinner and Thorndike and and Watson. You know, I think it was Watson who said, "Give me a kid by the time he's seven. Tell me what you want him to be, and I'll make him that." It's like you're mad. No, that's not how it works. So operant conditioning and classical conditioning completely ignores temperament. It it pays no attention to the individual animal. Um, you know, when people say we didn't have to put a choke collar on the killer whale, it's like no, you put him in a tank and you. You deprived him of almost everything that matters to him in his world. That's called taking them hostage. That's not actually training. And most people don't want to take their dogs hostage. But the concept that the scared dog at the back of the kennel, and you saw that at the dog's trust, you know, well, I'll take him home and love him, and then he'll be leading the pet parade next year at the fundraiser. It's like, no, no, some things that are broken can't be fixed, and, and some animals need a much smaller world to be comfortable in. And the funny part is, as people, we shape our worlds to the extent we have the power to do so. We shape the worlds that suit us. We do not go traveling to foreign countries where we don't speak the language if that makes us feel uncomfortable. We don't even eat spicy food if we don't like the way it makes our tummies rumble. But our dogs should learn to accommodate everything and get over some very broken or damaged or sometimes not even that anyone abused them, but that they never got important information at a time their brain needed it. So they're, they're more like um, the old Romanian orphans. They were fed, they were kept warm and dry, and some of them died just for lack of touch. So, And that's sometimes where the dogs are. No one's actually physically abused them or been bad to them, but no one ever talked to them, read them a bedtime story, showed them the world, um, made them feel safe. Yeah. So that, that is not always fixable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I actually have a case right now, very similar to actually, when you mentioned Romania. I have a Romanian street dog that has came across to, to the UK. We have quite a high prevalence of you know, dogs coming across from Europe and, and to, mm -hmm. into, into the UK and from Ireland um, too. And it's, it's difficult for them. They've never been acclimatised to this type of setting. They're coming through a really traumatic journey of being you know, in a van for hours into quarantine, then potentially from quarantine into a kennel and kennel into a home. You know, these dogs are not going to be well adjusted. They're not going to cope well. And my client um, had asked me about going on holiday and taking them to a pub. And you're like, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> don't no, do it. no fun in that for the dog. And I, I was just talking to a client who has a Romanian street dog. And I pointed out that, you know, just like if you buy a shepherd from me, that you've got all these generations of genetics behind them. But so do the street dogs. The genetics that got passed on were very smart, very savvy, not too fearful, but very cautious and wary. If you're too fearful, you'll never get fed. You know, you'll never take the opportunities, but if you're too friendly, you might find yourself in trouble. So those genetics got passed down. And they're not ones that uh, necessarily mesh well with being a pet in suburbia. Not at all. Yep. And we forget that part. Yeah, and if, if Carol and Karen are, are watching with regards to Floki, who's the Hungarian visual I was telling you about uh, earlier, that that point relates very much to those types of dogs that were bred for a purpose, right? And evolution hasn't necessarily caught up yet to, I guess, make them really suitable house pets. You know, a, a Border Collie, Vizsla, even a Labrador to a certain extent. They have genes, yeah, they have natural desires that they can't express and when they're put in a setting where they can't meet their needs naturally they're going to meet their needs inappropriately in undesirable behavior yeah they're, they're going to find a way to do it um i really like uh the chapter in coppinger's book on behavioral confirmation because we understand like if we were going to send a saint bernard down a, a small drain pipe to get a rat we'd think you're mad like uh, we don't, excuse me, ma'am, you know, that's, that's not a good plan. It's like, but he can do it. He'll be the first St. Bernard, you know, go to earth dog. It's like, no, no, he's not going to be. 
So we got that, but we don't seem to understand there's behavioral confirmation. So the, it, it's right down to the, the level of different neurotransmitters. How quickly does the border collie react? It's part of his job to have that lightning fast response because no one wants a sheepdog who says, I don't know. Weren't they? I don't know where they went. Someplace. This is why we don't use bassets. <laughs> Sure. We yeah. probably bred that, didn't we? We chose these dogs for that purpose. And I really I really feel for some dogs. I, I look at them and I feel for them because they have all of this urges and tendencies and genetic genetic predispositions and they never really get to express it now as if they're redundant almost in, in, in society. Their, their role is redundant. And, and I guess I wonder how many behaviour problems are born out of that that one issue alone is that you know there's natural behaviour needs to be expressed and it's not being and uh, I think of kennel dogs, but but also those dogs might, might not differentiate between a kennel and a living room, right? You know, they might not see any difference. They're still in captivity. Yep, exactly. And I think I think whenever we choose a breed, we have to we have to respect who they are. You know, it's it's like saying you get a little fat Shetland pony. Well, okay, he's not a racehorse, nor should he be asked to do the Grand National. Just like, <laughs> <for cold. laughs> yeah, like yeah. yeah going to get to the first one and it's all over but yeah we're just i don't know why i i had a, a man bring me a um a glen of a mall terrier so they have ginormous heads and they have huge teeth but they're very short stout bodies so he was doing agility but the dog was really having trouble in the a-frame because his center of gravity was so bad as he came down the dog would actually slam his own jaw shut before he could get his front legs just because of his confirmation of balance. And I said, you can't keep doing this to this dog. Same thing on jumps. And he goes, yeah, but no Glen of them all terriers had agility titles and I'm going to be the first. I'm like, but he's slamming his own. And he didn't want to hear it. And I thought, but you bought a dog that's actually meant to go hunt badger. There are no badger for him to hunt. Right. Do you have some other job for him to do? One that suits his body, which is meant to go into a badger set, not jump. So it's it's my personal crazyville. Um, it's like it's like, but that's who he is. You know, we have Scottish Highland cattle, and sometimes people will say, "Well, why don't you just cut their horns off?" It's like, if I wanted to breed without horns, I wouldn't have Scottish Highlands. That would be like going out and clipping off all their hair too. It's like, no, no, that's who they are. So. That, that weird concept that we can take a breed and make it what we want it to be and then kind of very procrustean, just kind of trim away the parts we don't like. It's like, yes, I know it's a coated breed with lots of hair, but that's so annoying, so I'm just going to clip it off. It's like, I just, I just, I don't get it. I just don't. And it breaks my heart for the dogs who are being themselves. They're just being themselves. Yep. Yeah, yeah it, because of people's expectations sometimes, isn't it? The lens of how they view, you know, going through that process of wanting to get a dog and their expectations of what that dog will be like. And then they bring, you know, a specific breed into their home and it just doesn't behave in the way that they, you know, kind of were, were expecting it to. And then they hold the dog accountable for that expectation, you know, and I guess there's a, a realignment required in society in terms of our dogs, um, I feel anyway. And the more we can kind of educate Kind of dog owners in terms of what they're looking for for you know a good pet versus you know bringing a working dog into your living room which is never going to go particularly well yeah so I, I it's one of my little pet projects right so we have my my temperament assessment tool carrot which really takes temperament and looks at it not i, I realize that the popular science right now is is trying to take the big five of personality and they're going to squash dogs into that, which I think is a, is a terrible idea. And it's not useful. Um, statistically, maybe a little bit, but not for the individual. So carrot is what we call the ethology of the individual. I really want to know. So I could, I could have four Vigilas in front of me, and I could say, all right, this one really needs to go to a gun dog home because this dog really, when he gets his nose involved and he's in motion and he's high energy... He's going to persist in that. This dog doesn't need to be a, a gun dog. This dog is very affectionate, social, likes to close space, is biddable, willing to play whatever silly game you come up with. But you can call them back off of, of birds. You know, they're not that intense about using their nose. 
So that's where we start to get to the, the qualities of the individual. So my next little project is going to, I'm not sure I'm going to work it out. I was trying to help a lady understand why the puppy she adopted went so bad because the rescue had not pulled her. And she said, well, she was just really mellow and easygoing. And I said, let me, let me explain. So that means she was laying there chewing her toy with nice relaxed movements. And when you came in, she looked up, made eye contact, maybe wagged her tail, continued chewing her bone. She says, well, no. I said, or was she laying very still as far away as she could get and avoiding eye contact with you um, and only looking at you if you moved or started or she's like that. And I'm like, that's not mellow. So I'm like, we need, we need to start teaching people to think about just like real estate. So a realtor would ask you, where do you want to live? And it's like, oh, I don't care. I just want a place to live. Well, that's just a silly concept, you know? It's like, all right, do you want to live in town? Do you want to live in the country? Let's start. How many bedrooms do you need? What are the non-negotiables? And then what are the things that, if that was there, that'd be cool. But it, if it had a bigger kitchen, but it didn't have a pool, okay, that, that's workable. We don't have a sense of that. And I don't see that that's true in adopting pets, that we get the owners to understand these are the qualities. This, these, these you know, how much will you be willing to groom? are not quite as, as important as how does the dog use space? Do you want a dog who's wanting to lay on the couch and watch telly with you? Or do you want a dog who's, don't follow me around, I don't want Velcro dog. There are dogs that say, I can see you from here. And they're very disappointing to people who are like, I just wanted him to hug me. I had a client get bit by her Welshie and she called me and she said, shit, 2730 sutures on her face and the dog had bit her in the lips. And I was like, just got to ask the question, how did your lips get to a Welshie? <laughs> it's just not that big a dog. So tell me how that happened. Such a good example. And I, and I have uh, one, yeah, one like that too, where a, a lady had a kind of preconceived idea of how to interact with her dogs. And, and, and she had, I think, four or five Airedales. And every Airedale that she had, she would, you know, pet them in the head, kiss them in the head and go to bed. She rescued one, two days into the home, did the same thing, you know, the outcome was pretty poor, but you're like, you, your expectation of your dog was the issue there rather than the dog itself. And, and I wonder how much that would have been profiled by the rescue in terms of, as you say, temperament. You mentioned your carrot tool there, Suzanne. Do you mind going to just, just a bit more depth? Well, what does carrot actually stand for? Let me just bring carrot up. is the Clothier Animal Response Assessment Tool. <laughs> <laughs> we were just looking for some goofy acronym, but it's, uh, yeah. It's, it's actually kind of powerful. So it's been around for a while. It's, it's looking at different aspects that as a breeder and a longtime trainer, I will say are traits that I find very consistent across the dog's life. For example, as a breeder, if I have a dog that comes out and is a really energetic dog till their body fails them, you know, they, they are responsive in their brain. So we look at a, a number of things in a very finely grained way, and we, we start with a bi-directional scale so that if I show you a snake and, and you're not a big fan of snakes, your response might be what we call left shift, avoidant, like, <gasps> I like snakes. So I'd be like, yay, same exact stimulus can have two very different responses. So we're just borrowing from some very um, well-established principles in, in behavior and biology. One is activate or inhibit, right? So one stimulus can have exactly, some dogs move towards gunshot, some dogs move away. So we recognize that anything can create that response. And on that bi-directional scale, the midpoint is balanced and adaptive, but that will actually work for that animal across a huge variety of, of um, circumstances. But as you get to more extreme responses, the animal becomes dysfunctional. So the dog who's absolutely just flat out terrified is noise sensitive, but then gunshots, he, he can't think anymore. He's done, totally shuts down or is so sensitive that they can't shut it off. Um, yep, this is where we go. So we look at energy, physical energy, just how does the dog move? Given, given the freedom to move at any speed he wants, some dogs walk. You know, we have two in the household. Their bumper sticker says, why you know, why walk when you can gallop and why gallop when you can fly and why even touch the ground if there's furniture you can just bounce off of. 
and they it's like living with pet gazelles um they're perfectly capable of walking and they can be very lovely animals but yeah they're higher energy than most people want in their house so we have we have energy we have arousal how quickly is that animal activated and aroused and which way because arousal can both be um avoidant like oh what i call the oh no side of the scale and then the right shift is the oh yeah side of the scale and again at the end of these these scales you're dysfunctional you're, you're not able to deal well it's going to affect what you're uh, trying to achieve so energy and resilience energy arousal resilience how quickly once you're stimulated can you come back and be back in balance and for some animals i remember asking one lady if your dog gets upset how long does it take for recovery so oh she's usually okay in two or three days like two or three days and we say a, a zero at that mid score point that dog has resolved it in under five five to ten seconds usually under five like they almost resolve it like what uh oh, on the fly they're resolving it so when we're talking service dogs for example there's not a whole lot of range where these dogs have a lot of leeway a pet animal we can say oh i just have to get there 15 minutes early and let him work it out and then we look at the physiological um how does the dogs what's his response to sensory input so we look at visual input auditory olfactory and kinesthetic and how sensitive is the dog to that so a left shift on and any sensory um issue would be the dog is blind for example would be completely off the left side of the scale but you can also have an animal who's so sensitive to that type of sensory input that they become dysfunctional so there's a, a nice line with the border collies, for example, where a good working border collie is, is faster to notice. He's more visual, he's more responsive to it than the average bear. But you can also get to the border collie who once that's triggered is obsessive about it. He persists in it to the point where he's dysfunctional. So we look at that, that input, then we look at persistence, then we look at biddability Bit ability with a familiar, bit ability with a stranger, because depending, you know, you have shepherds. So to take someone else's shepherd, the shepherd often thinks, "I don't know you, <laughs> don't know you at all." As a matter of fact, and why should I? And sometimes half my house will happily go work with anybody. They're very good about it. But I just want to know: is there a difference? Because that's an important thing to know if I'm selecting, say, for a service dog, or if I'm selecting for a search and rescue dog we did a search and rescue camp once and half the team they had shepherds and the other team had a border collie and so they were able to capture the border collie because they're like come with us we know the same words and all the right cues the border collie said oh, oh okay the shepherd went home he's like he went back and it's like they're hiding over there in that thicket he's like you'll never take me alive yeah they're like come here he's like hmm, i don't think so so we look at that and then we look at the social aspects we look at and I, I really think it's important that these are broken down sociability does the dog want to interact does he enjoy social interactions now that can range from an assault i'm going to interact with you whether you want me to or not or the dog who's at the absolute back of the run you know i want nothing to do with this that that full range social use of space because a dog can be very friendly, but not actually very rude and vice versa. You can have dogs who are, you know, going to wear your sweater with you. How, how do they use space? And that can be important. If I'm choosing a service dog, for example, that has to make contact, that has to try to get through someone whose blood sugar is dropping and has to be willing to make this. They have to be kinesthetically persistent. They also have to be willing to use that space and to use it um, with confidence. And other times, like I said, the lady who wants the dog on the couch. Well, if you choose the puppy or the dog who says, I'll be six feet over there, I don't want to rest next to you, you're going to be massively disappointed when you drag him up on the couch. We just warn people when they get a puppy from me that you better have a sturdy spleen because our dogs believe they're close enough. If our spleens are touching, they believe that's, that's finally close enough. It's like, ah. Oh they are up close and personal and then the the final part of sociability is we look at social tolerance 
So how quickly is this dog um, likely to perceive that what a human does is rude or intolerant and what's their response? Do they just politely move a body part out of the way? Do they actually get aggressive? Do they feel threatened and anxious, the left shift dogs? Do they feel irritated on the other side? So that when you look at this carrot profile, it's all color coded and the scores, you get this beautiful rounded graphic, which at a glance, like you're like, whoa, that dog's got some issues there. <laughs> yeah. There's some applications for that too. Um, because I think traditionally, particularly in rescue, those types of profiling can be quite un unreliable. Is that fair to say when, in, when you're looking at a dog in the conditions of being in a kennel shelter or whatever it's yep. quite hard to profile that when they are then changing context changing environment and then going into a home but i could see some wide range of applications for, for that carrot system for you know like a standard dog owner to try and get the right type of dog for them to profile the right type of dog but also you mentioned that it has kind of professional elements to it, guide dogs service dogs search and rescue too so wide, wide applications for sure it sounds interesting where can people find out more about that yes and that's on your website it's on my website. Uh, we've got a intro to carrot course starting online in the fall. I think that starts in November. Um, so that's that's the the one path. At one point, we had a a nice certification process going, and then COVID hit, and it all went. We're just reorganizing the world. Um, but the cool thing is, the intro to carrot will give you a nice, strong um, sense. And what people say is, carrot changes everything because once you see through that lens. You understand the dog, for example, even as simple as a dog who's who's just not wanting to come really close on a recall and a formal obedience exercise. It's like he that's not his thing, right? His use of space is different. Um, and it also helps us identify, are these good candidates? So like I'm working with service dog schools. Whether or not they take my advice is another story, but I have a really good track record as a breeder. It's like, you tell me what you want, I'll tell you whether I've got a puppy that actually can do that job for you. Um, and then it's a matter of lifestyle. But once you've got that picture of what the suitable candidate looks like, it's, it's back to the real estate analogy. Once the realtor knows you want a detached house with three, you know, three bedrooms and two baths and it's got to have a big garden and it should be within 20 minutes of a, a major town or university, they can then sort. I'm not going to show you all the, the fourth story apartments in town. I'm not going to waste your time. But it's like, but it has a beautiful kitchen. It's like, and this is what we do with dogs. They're like, but I saw his face online. And I knew he was my soulmate. It's like, but... <laughs> But, but <laughs> yeah. okay, so it's the whole package, and um, yeah, I parrot can also be applied to any other species. I mean, you just have to adjust so we, we can look at horses that way, um, we can look at dogs, chickens. I've looked at chickens that way, piglets, you know, donkeys. It's once you and then people start doing it to people, like when they come to workshops, they would go out to dinner that night and they're they would be like, you know doing a carrot assessment on the waitress or the table, the table next to them, or my favorite, their family members, you know, it's always one woman told, uh, cause you know, every animal's got a place, right? It's just whether or not it's a very generalized, highly adaptable animal. Cause when we say a dog has good temperament, we often mean, and we often say about a dog or horse, you can take him anywhere. You can do anything with him he's going to be the same. You take him out of the float or you take him out of the van and he's like, okay. Right. That's not, it's the same dog you have at home in the kitchen is the same dog you have in the park is the same dog you have at the show, which is the same dog you have up in the fields. And so the more changeable the dog, the more I know that it's a more behaviorally fragile dog and less adaptable. We use the uh, borrowed from child psychology. Is this a dandelion or is this an orchid? And there's nothing wrong with either one of them. They're not superior to each other. It's just, are you willing to do what is necessary to take care of an orchid and recognize if that doesn't happen, that orchid's not going to thrive. Whereas dandelions, it no one actually seems to take care. <laughs> they, they just carry on. They're highly adaptable. Um, so that it's okay if you want an orchid, but just understand that's not going to be a dog you can go traveling with or take to the pub or have over when you have big birthday parties and he'll run 
free and wear a hat and the children can you know dress him up it's like no not this dog but that's that's where i'm at before i die is can we please have a a more finely grained understanding of temperament and not saying well if you just train him it's like yes but just training him does not remove his temperament it doesn't nope you have a diagram you mentioned for that, uh, Susanna. I think I've found it. I'll bring it up. I may have got the wrong one, but let me oh, okay. pop up on the screen. Is that what you're talking about? Yep. Yeah, great. Do you mind chatting that through with us? Is that okay? Right. So if you figure that the, the green is our midpoint, and then you'll yep. see some, some are much bigger and some are smaller. And so the scale goes from zero to minus four and zero to plus four. So when we look at Chippy here, we have a we have a very challenging dog. The fact that you've got that much orange says he is struggling in many, many ways. This would not be a um, a great family dog, to say the least. He's not socially tolerant. You can see his social confidence. Those are complex scores on the bottom there. Um, he's not confident in his environment. He's not confident socially in his interactions. He's auditorily sensitive. So you see the plus one and a half there on auditory awareness. Uh, it's like... Uh, he's also sensitive to touch. So then if we combine that with like his minus two on social tolerance, touch this dog, he may not find it. Let's say we're going to put a harness on him. And he says, I don't really like that. He's already not feeling confident or wanting the interaction very much. And then on top of that, we now tap the very sensitive part of him. I, oh, and also if you look at the minus two and a half on visual awareness, he has um, significant visual issues. <laughs> So he's he's not going to see well what you're doing. He's sensitive to what you're doing, and he's not particularly tolerant of the fact that you did it. And the whole thing is is uncomfortable for him. So this would be a very uh, difficult dog. Doesn't mean it's not a lovable dog and one that you can't enjoy living with. But you just have to know if you selected this as a family dog, you're probably going to spend a lot of money talking to veterinarians, behaviorists, and trainers. Whereas a guide dog, a service dog, this score would be what we call Caribbean. It's almost all blues and greens, mostly greens with blues. Um, and like at a glance, we're like, oh, nice, nice dog. <laughs> so once you learn the system, even people who don't understand the nuances can very rapidly um, assess that this, this is not a family dog. So if we just took the social and the core, it's like his use of space, he's avoidant, he does not, he's not tolerant, and it worries him, it upsets him. He's sociable, if you call him, he'll interact. When he's upset, that minus two and a half means he's going to get extremely distressed. Um, not to the point of dysfunction, but pretty intense, and it's going to take him a while to bounce back. And the energy just says a zero. So right there, if I only use just that chunk of his assessment, we already know... This is not a family dog. This is not this is not a, a good dog for, for kids. It's super. So so useful too in terms of profiling. <clears throat> and I wonder if we use this more, we might get better matches between owners, owners and their dogs. And, and you mentioned the great ones about kind of handling perception and people's perception of getting a dog, want to pet them, want to cuddle them, you know, and, and through this we might be able to mitigate those mismatches just by a great assessment tool. So that's that's fantastic. Um, I wonder if we could have a cat. It also, yeah, it also helps, um, Jim, when they've got a dog that's not a great match, but understanding that it's not that if they were better handlers or if they just used a different tool or if they had this special leash, like, no, 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 that, that's who he is. And now let's see what we can do. And it's, it's sometimes a huge relief for handlers because they've been told, well, you use that collar. That's why he's the way he is. Like, he was that way in his mother's womb. <laughs> like, there, there was a lot cooking before he ever saw you, and it's not because of that leash. Mm -hmm. Not to take it personally either when you have those types of dogs. Who yes, exactly. Yeah. That helps them a lot because they do take it personally. Um, and it's just like, oh, like he's got his nose stuck in the ground because that's what really suits his brain. And our last dog didn't do it. It's like, well, your one kid loves to read, and the other kid thinks reading is the most boring thing ever. It's like, oh, it's like, great. Temperament. Temperament matters. Yeah, how often do you hear that? You know, I've had, I've had a dog before and, you know, that's how a dog should behave and now I have another dog and they're not 
um, meet those expectations. That's so, so challenging. I wonder if um, we could have a chat about the the relationship centre training that that um, that you pioneer, um, Suzanne. I wonder if we're going to chat around about that. If you can maybe just kind of unpack it a little bit for for us in terms of the relationship centre training. Yep. So relationship center training first says at the center of all it's, it's the overarching philosophy for what I do. I'm, I'm not interested in, in behaviorism. I'm not interested in operant conditioning or any technique or school of thought. I just want to know how does this affect the relationship? So if it's not supportive of the relationship, then it better be medically necessary is my, my theory. So we're looking, I began to realize that people would come to 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 me with these dogs and I would break it down into is it a connection piece that's not working well for them is it a communication piece that's not working well or is it a commitment piece so those are the three things I, I, I looked at and I thought I had met people that were the communication piece right so that's how do you provide information what's your feedback loop do you do you actually see what the dogs giving you in terms of information um, and what are the consequences so you could be technically very skilled in that but when we get to the commitment part it, it, there's no heartfelt you can you can be totally technically correct and yet very unaware of the dog and very disconnected from him so what i was looking for is where is it gone gone awry because if it's just a timing issue i can fix that so you'll get you'll get clients that they love their dogs with all their hearts. They are aware of the dog. They're sensitive to the dog. They respect the dog, but they're just they're really struggling with the commun communication piece. And others, no, they know all the words. They know all the jargon. They've got all the titles, and still, they're missing a really big part, or they don't actually respect the dog. And that could be as simple as, give me your foot, I'm going to wipe the mud off it, without even asking the dog, may I have your foot, please? Um, it, it, we do this all the time to dogs. Um, or we say, oh, no, no, I respect my dog. And then it's like, well, I'm going to put you in this position that you're not really comfortable in, but too bad, because I want to get this title. It's like, all right. So, so that just became a foundation for, it just meant I looked at things in a different lens. So trainers would send me, problem clients and then I would send them home with a completely different set of solutions they were like well let's teach them sit stay and down stay and self-control and you know teach them to watch me and all this and that that wasn't the problem <laughs> therefore it didn't resolve much I, I always say it's like Timmy Timmy you know he knows uh, math and French and he's the head of the chess club and he's an expert fencer okay I have no idea what that has to do with his relationship with his mom, his dad, and his sister. It has nothing to do with it, actually. And he could go learn Sanskrit, and it still won't. So we mistook training and developing skills. Because sometimes when you do that, you do develop a relationship in trying to work out how to do that. But we have it backwards. It's, no, 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 fix the relationship. Then anybody can then learn whatever they're interested in learning. So that just that changed everything and that led to rat where <laughs> rats a relationship assessment tool and that one literally has it's a, it's a very uh fast rapid assessment because people would they'd get a dog out of the car and by the time they'd walk to my training building they pretty much had an idea like w all the big problems <clears throat> not the presented problems but the actual foundation issues that i needed to fix so then I just structured that very formally. And um, yeah, that became quite powerful, actually, to help people understand which side of the leash is. Because I could, I could hand you a dog with some problems, and I could see on Jim's side of the, of the score sheet, no, no, he, he does read the dog well. He is providing good direction. He's anticipating what the situation is and how best to help the dog through it. He is informative. He is um, connected and aware. And the dog could be completely disconnected and unaware and uh, highly aroused. But it can go the other way, too. So what the rat score sheet does in a, the first five minutes or so is you've already got a sense of what's what on either end of the leash. Where are the strengths? Where are the weaknesses? What are you going to build on? So that that is a particularly fun tool. And so we've just started offering that that course online and that 
people people are really liking that because once they have a sense of it, they're like, oh my God, you can see all of it. It's like, yes, yes, you can. Then you know what you're going to focus on. And that's your website there, isn't it, Suzanne? That people can go and check out these uh, great content and webinars. Yep, we've got we've got oh my god, a lot of webinars. We're just about to redo the website and open up a membership site as well. But if you go to that website, you'll find the recorded webinars, the upcoming courses. You'll get the links to to all of this. Fantastic. You mentioned you touched on something there, which I'm really passionate about, which is consent and uh, working consent with animals. I think it's such a shift. And it's such a fantastic way to interact with an animal generally. And uh, I wonder if we can have a chat around consent based training and maybe if you've got some examples of where that truly really enhanced the relationship between, you know, an owner and their dog, for example. I, I think if we don't understand the concept of consent and what I, I call this is a sovereign being, you know, he is not just the thing that we do with as we like. I mean, certainly that's a familiar approach. Just, you know, literally just grab them like, oh, come here, you. It's like, you know what? If, if I was a dog, I'd have been put down <laughs> for biting because, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, my answer would have been no, chomp. I don't think so. Um, even as a kid, I was not I was not a child that people picked up and, and just smushed. It's like, I don't think so. So I think working with horses certainly taught me that you really should have their agreement and cooperation or someone's going to get hurt. And it wasn't usually the horse. Um, <laughs> so that that taught me a great deal. But it's a matter of respect. Like, this is what I intend to do. And so it's a, it's a hobby around here. <clears throat> if we're going to do something with an animal, we tell them what it is. And I don't care if that's a tortoise or it's one of the parrots or it's the, you know, unless it's an emergency and I don't have time. Like, like I, I don't have a choice. I'm going to pick you up to save your ass. Um, otherwise, we tell them what's going to happen. So our vets have thought that was very odd because we would tell a cow who was a field cow. It's not, it's not a pet that we've trained or handled. It's like, really sorry. We're going to put a rope around your horns. We're going to tie you to this post. This is what's going to happen. And just give us a moment to explain to the cow what's going to happen. And, you know, initially the vets kind of rolled their eyes like, oh, okay. It's like, well, do you get hurt by our animals? No, you do not. <laughs> do you get cooperation from our animals? Yes, you do. You know why? Because we take the time to actually say, hang on, are you, this is what needs to happen. Can you do this? Because often, and I think this is one of the most important parts of consent, very often you didn't have to. And people are like, well, I had to. It's like, no, no, you didn't. Even that's like the nails. There's no nail police. You know, they don't knock on your door and go, Mr. Jin, we understand you've only trimmed two of your dog's nails and the rest are still long. <laughs> with us. It's like, well, I have to do them all now. It's like, no, you want to do them all now. Let's be very clear. And so there's an article on my website, I had to. It's probably one of the phrases that will set my buttons like crazy. Why did you have to? Was it medically necessary? Was he bleeding? Was he going to die or kill somebody? No, really? Hmm. Then why did you have to? Oh, for your convenience, because you wanted to get this done. And so, and I say that living with a lot of animals where sometimes, very rarely is it, you must do it now. We actually usually have time to say, all right, let me show you what we've got. These are the bandages. This is the stuff. This is what has to happen. You know, our little donkeys, when we got them, they did not agree very much to being handled. They hadn't been. So we helped them with um, some medication because it was so scary for them. I didn't want them to practice. But after that, it was like now between visits with the farrier. So can we just do this? Can I just touch your leg? Is that okay? Can you give me your leg? Are you in agreement? And if you're not, then we stop. I, I don't fight you. I don't wrestle with you. I ask for agreement. Consequently, we have really nice donkeys that are quite polite. And when they put their foot down, then everyone respects them. The vets, the farrier, everyone knows. Give them a moment. Let's see what we can do. And maybe we'll call it good for today. And maybe we'll work on it tomorrow. But consent has to include really deep respect for that sovereign being and also that concept that we have an agenda they don't 
so they want ahead. they want to feel safe and i think it's i think it's one of the the saddest ways that people undermine the trust they want their dogs to trust them and yet they do not ask in ways that would lead you to be labeled trustworthy by an animal they're like oh she's very nice but um yeah if it gets dicey it's all men for themselves because she won't be paying attention to you saying this is not cool for me and, and some people might not be familiar when we talk about consent about how we achieve that um with, with an animal and, and there are some really simple ways that we can do it consent checks or petting consent checks is probably the easiest where we get a little bit of affection withdraw attention and they guide us in terms of what happens next I have a hilarious video that I'd like to share with you, and I think you'll really appreciate this, uh, Suzanne. Let me bring, bring this up. I think you'll love this. You may have seen it before if you have, but let me just take me out here with me a second. Look at that butt. My goodness. <laughs> I want more. <laughs> <laughs> Bum scratches are life. Okay. Isn't that a great example of just consent? Uh, like, it could not, not be any clearer, right? Yeah, that was a great example. <laughs> we, had the, we had the opposite um, at Wolf Park when, when I was teaching there at Wolf Park. And so people, when they get into the enclosure with the wolves, they're like, oh, right? Sometimes they're not as um, soul-touched when it's a real wolf standing right next to them, right? But once a wolf would present himself for petting people were just they got into this like crazy weird trance like they were just petting a wolf and the wolf is giving all these signals like okay you know it was like a a greeting or a hug that was going on way too long and so then they would start to stiffen up and then sometimes they had to you know make a, a growl or a snap and the staff used to say why don't you give him a moment and i was there one day and i thought you know why that's not working well? Because <laughs> no one knows what you mean. It's like, so let's explain it as if someone's pouring a cup of coffee. It's like, you know, say when. And, and the guest says when and the host just keeps pouring it. You think, are you mad? Stop it. Um, so it was one, you know, pet him. One, what I teach is, you know, one, two, three, hand off. Because in that space, you give the animal room to either move away and say, thank you. Nice to meet you. Or, no, no, like that pony, you know, that falls. <laughs> I, not done? Let's go. Get that butt going. <laughs> and so when you give them a chance, and, and I find I find sometimes we're like, you know, if you talk to someone where they just keep talking, and you can't get a, a word in Edward. You're looking at your watch. You're like, you know, you're starting to back away, and they just keep coming. It's like, could you just be quiet for a minute and see what the animal chooses to do? Did they say, okay, I'm good with this. I'm, I'm, I'm okay here. And even in a veterinary situation, that's possible without a whole lot of training. It doesn't mean we have to go all teach the bucket game or a chin rest or anything, which is nice and it's lovely and it's wonderful. But just the act of, are you okay here? Are you okay here? Yeah. I love the bucket game. Um, you mentioned that there. Uh, Shirag Patel that, that devised that, I believe. Um, a wonderful, a wonderful train. If, if nobody's seen the bucket, uh, bucket game before, you know, punch it into YouTube and have a look at it. It's a little bit more of a complicated training process, the bucket game. I, I mm -hmm. feel we demonstrate to a, to a normal dog owner. But yeah. It has so many uh, wide ranging applications in terms of communication and trust and almost like start buttons, which I love too, is just given that ability to communicate, opening up a dialogue. And uh, that could only be a good thing, particularly in kind of cooperative care when you're having to do something. But my dog right now has a, a kind of dermatitis on his leg, and I've taught him a little start button of where he can just push his nose against my hand, and, and I'm good to go. And, and then I touch him again, and he's good to go again. You have that consent. We're talking about it, here he comes uh, popping in. He's got a cone on just now, so he's not, he's not too happy. Um, but it's a great example, isn't it, of giving that ability and open up a dialogue. And that can mitigate a lot of potential aggression particularly from a dog where they can consent to that handling and, and give us clear clear indications and signals is that fair yeah because how how else can they tell us like enough already stop you know a human could say like i i don't want to do this anymore this is too scary or that hurt or you know we could tell that to our hairdresser i mean if we ever go back to hairdressers but um you know i have one dog she was a, a preemie and so she's she's much more kinesthetically sensitive as it turns out a lot of uh, humans, when they're born premature, have um, 
highly sensitized uh, touch system. So if I were to just, you know, and it was just old fashioned thinking, I'd just put a nice collar on her and I'd have a leash and I just kind of, you stay here so I can brush you. You have shepherds. So you can imagine with seven shepherds, it's just, this is how I'm going to die. I'm going to run for the phone and I'm going to slid on a hair slick and then I will die. It's just going to be a pile of German shepherd hair. But, and so she would, she would just balk against it. And I'm like, you have to get brushed. And of course, in reality, she didn't because no one brushes wolves and magically their hair falls out. But, um, so I, I tried that one year. I was like, just be a wolf then. And that was crazy. But I thought, all right, you stand here. As long as you stand here freely, then I'll brush you. If you walk away, I'll stop. And then you come back if you want to. And I thought, we'll see how that works. And so she would go away when she was done. And then I would invite her, like, you want to do some more? And she's like, okay. And so now she will actually come and stay for very long periods but because she knows she's free to move away and that I won't go chasing after her. Um, to do that. But it extends further. Like this old girl that I've got here, she's 13 and a half. Big cyst on her tail, so it has to be bandaged twice a day. And the only the only support is the, the one moment when I have to put the fresh bandage on. It's a little ouchy. My husband will just support her under her, under her waist. But there's no leash or collar. It's just here. We're going to give you some cat food. Are you okay to eat that? As long as you're happily looking, not that's that's our consent because when she takes her head out of the cat food it's a warning like it's getting close it's like all right give you a moment but it's it's all said and done in five to seven minutes and this is a this is a painful wound but there's no need to 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 happen so i just find that when i go that way and i stay with the relationship and i think about everything as a conversation I don't, I don't think training My training to me is I'm going to teach some stupid specific task. The rest of the time it's, it's a conversation like I have with my husband and the quality of that conversation. I get to choose. Do I want to have a sloppy casual muttered over my shoulder or do I, do I want to say, Hey, look, this is serious. I need you to turn off the TV and I'm going to shut off my computer and we really need to focus. But I do the same with the dogs. It's like, come on, you know, I have casual, let's go hang out, guys, versus I mean this. This is very important. This is not negotiable right here. So, But I'm always aware that it's a conversation, always. And all behavior is just that communication, isn't it? And we need to reframe that in society, I think, particularly with dogs, is that they're just communicating with us. You know, they're not trying to give us a hard time. Most of the time, they're having a hard time themselves, right, particularly if they're rescue dogs you know they're, they're having to adjust much more to us than we are to them and i think we need to be sympathetic towards that um, and i think it's just that alignment in society which is, is a challenge and it's difficult um, and it's definitely ongoing and one of the protocols which which we spoke about before coming on was the the wonderful treat, re, uh, treat and retreat which is just such a wonderful protocol and i wonder if you could maybe talk people through that who aren't familiar with treat and retreat what that means and how you go about doing it if you don't mind so treat retreat I developed for use with dogs that were fearful because <clears throat> interacting with people is a very complex thing and most of us don't do it very well, right? So treat retreat said, I recognize that dogs and other animals would have used it on cows and horses as well. Um, they'll come as close as they feel comfortable if you leave them the room to do that. If you've not blown through their threshold, they will come just as close as they feel comfortable. So the, the treat is thrown to them right there, and then it's thrown behind them into a safer zone. Because if you think about treat, treat it, the dog's at the edge of his safe bubble. This is like, this is as close as I want to get. And people do this all the time. If it's a spider or a snake, they're like, no, I, I can see it from here, you know, um, versus how close can I get? That's not someone who's worried about it. So that what I found was the dogs don't know how to move away. So they get to learn to move away. There's a big relief that comes when they're not, they're not trying to be lured in. It's not the indecent proposal of I've got more cookies. If you come closer, cause I think, I think that is an indecent proposal. <coughs> That's like saying, how much would it cost you, Jim, to do this thing you don't really want to do? Like I have a checkbook. Come on, you know, name your price. This says where you were. Nice job. 
and now you can move away. So now you have a choice to come back to the edge of that bubble if you want to. Only the dog gets to move that bubble. The relief that dogs experience in this is so profound that people think it just can't, it can't be that simple. It's like, it actually isn't simple. It's actually quite complex, but the dog's like, oh, well, that was okay. And it comes back, tries it again. We move him away, comes back, we move him again. And you start to see the dogs start to experiment and they start to move that zone. And ultimately we get to the point with some dogs where we're using humans as equipment. The dogs are climbing through human jungle gyms and human tunnels and, you know, um, it's a very powerful tool. <clears throat> As of last year, we started a um, treat retreat certification course. So it's a comp course, but yeah, that's available online. That starts again in January. Um, so for trainers that like working with dogs that are fearful and shy, it is it is such a powerful tool to have in your in your kit that um, it's hard to say until you've seen it work. People think it can't be that simple. It's like, oh, simple can be very powerful. It's a genius of it. It's the simplicity. There's a lot going on, isn't there? Behaviorally, you know, emotionally, but it's the genius in the simplicity for me. It's so simple, but there's lots going on and we need to appreciate that. But it's so effective and it really has helped thousands of dogs. So it makes me it makes me happy to know that dogs all around the world have have really been helped by this. You know, dogs that were just moderately unsure have really gone on and sailed, and dogs that were truly deeply um, terrified have found some some comfort in some way because every single interaction they have with people for these dogs is just fraught with danger. So it's it's almost like if you were to walk down your, your village street and every single person you saw, you thought, you know, I don't know what they're going to do. I... I you know, we just forget what it feels like to walk through this war zone. You know, I, if every every everybody's a possible bomb or a cobra or whatever the heck it is, or it's a clown, whatever scares you. Um, yeah, it's, it, oh, okay, that's not a clown, or she's not going to look at me, or he's not going to try to touch me. I think for these poor dogs, the relief, I, I think it's, I don't even know that we can quantify it other than I will say that is exactly the look I see on the dog's face of that's how you do that. So now it's intrinsically driven. This is It's not because of the treats. The treats just assist us. It's the way it's set up with respect for the dog's fear and saying, you tell us where safe is. And you tell us if that changes too, because it can. You can make a mistake. You miss throw a treat, something happens in the environment, and the dog says, oh, I'm backing it out to here. It's like, that's fine. It, it's your choice um, in a very powerful way. So thanks for bringing that up. But, yeah, January we start with the new certification course. I'll certainly enroll myself in that, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I just think it's so it's so profound because for these dogs, the fear is real. Like, these are serious monsters in their environment. We might think... A car is just part of our environment. To a border collie that's been in Ireland and never exposed to traffic before, it is a real monster. I mean, it is profound in terms of the fear they're experiencing. I watched that fantastic video of yourself, Suzanne, where you were talking about you know a dog feeling safe, and that if we, no matter what we do from a counter condition and desensitisation, <clears throat> excuse me, perspective, if they don't feel safe, it'll undermine everything. Yeah, it's like taking someone who's afraid of snakes and standing them next to a big python and you just keep putting $20 bills in their hand. They're like, okay, I really want to pay my mortgage off, so I'll take it. But if you think that got rid of the fear of the snake, no. And in fact, sometimes I think we magnify it because now we've compounded and practiced that conflict, which I think gets dogs in so much trouble, especially the dogs that are driven by food. And they're like, I don't actually want to do this, but there is a cookie. But it's the same reason people do stupid stuff for the sake of money, jobs that they hate, that really stress them out. It's like, well, I like the paychecks. Like, just be aware of what you're doing. You, that's a choice you can make, but don't do it to a dog. Don't do it to a dog. And that relates to like hand feeding too, doesn't it? There's so much risk involved in putting your limb down into the face of a dog with a, with a food reward. And it is something that you see is quite prevalent too with the sniff test. And I'm not sure where that came from, where 
we put our hand into the face of a dog to allow them to, <clears throat> excuse me, to sniff us. I don't know where it came from, but it is a really dangerous thing to do. And, and... It's a bad thing to do. And I'm, I'm also not a fan of, for like resource guarding dogs, when they say, well, sit on the floor and then feed them out of a bowl that's in your lap. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. That's your resource that you're sharing that teaches him nothing about what to do when it's his resource. Yeah. I'm like, that just tells him that you're not aggressive around your food bowl. <laughs> Why are we making clients do that? Like, oh, and then the dog thinks, okay, now that it's mine, now the rules are, are different. It's like, oh, could we think this through, please? And I do. I spend a lot of time thinking things through from the dog's point of view. My husband came home one day and he found me on the kitchen rug and I'm just like, just like digging like a dog. He's like, and... Yeah, well, what is it you're doing now? I was like, I'm training, clearly, trying to work out something. And it was a um, physical rehab job. So this was back in the 90s before they had sports medicine and people would bring me dogs to rehab. And I was like, if I had really loose shoulder muscles and I wanted to tighten them up, I was going through all these motions that I could maybe get the dog to do. And yeah, turned out I was right. Digging in deep, wet sand actually built up those muscles. But my husband's just like, how is that... You that's your job. I'm like, I'm working something out here. I got to, I got to be a dog. I can't just think about it or look at anatomy picture. I got to feel that in my body. What does that feel like? So I always, I always do try to be empathetic. And I, I think Franz Duvall, the great ethologist and primatologist, I, he's just one of my great heroes. He says, we cannot help but be anthropomorphic to think that the anthropomorphism is bad is foolish that we need objective anthropomorphism. First of all, we're anthros. We're going to always see things through those eyes, right? And many of the great ethologists had no problem imaginatively projecting themselves into the other's foot and thinking, if that were me, if that were me, I might experience that that way. Is that also true for you? And then how would I know? How would I know? There's nothing wrong in guessing. The people that say, you, you shouldn't try to speak dog. I'm like, why? I try to speak man. I try to speak child. I try to speak husband all the time. Why? It's how we all communicate. We're guessing. We're guessing. I think you think that's funny. So I'll say that. And I was like, oh, well, I was wrong about that. I, I, I don't see anything wrong with projecting. I just have to check that what I'm projecting is matching up with what the animal's actually saying. They have to line up for me. Because they have sensory modalities which we will probably never be able to perceive. It is a hard thing to do, but there's no harm in putting ourselves in their position, particularly where where there's fear involved. You know, we have to look at that from from their perspective that this is a real threat to their survival, whether we think it's you know, novel or you know we're used to it in our environment. These dogs will feel that profoundly fear, and. Um, so yeah, so, so you mentioned um, earlier, Suzanne, about um, a, a tool for assessing behaviour that, that we spoke about, which is called a functional assessment tracking tool. Can, can we speak a little bit about that? I was really interested to find out more about that. That's okay. Right. So this one is, is Carrot looks at, at, at temperament. What are, what are these persistent traits and, and characteristic responses that are probably going to persist across the life of the dog? What are the um, rat looks at the relationship? If I give you this dog, what do you look like? If I give you a different dog, I put you know, your dog with a different handler, what are, it's about the dynamics of that specific dog, that specific handler in that specific moment. The functional assessment tracking tool is really a, that this comes out of my husbandry background, you know, whether I was managing kennels or barns, there's a, there's a fine art to having a clue what should be normal and appropriate for that species. And then how is that, that's a, Hmm, I'll keep an eye on it, or, oh, I'm calling the vet right now, that's bad. Um, so functional assessment tracking looks at physiological function, and it's more like saying, how are you today, Jim? You're like, not good, I have the flu, I was up all night, you know, hurling out of both ends, and, uh, oh, you're like, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> that may not make you the best interviewer today, don't know. So we look at physiological, how is the, how is the animal actually functioning within himself as a being. So this I think has great value for shelters too. So not just temperament, but if we have a dog who's struggling to function. So we all know this, we take a dog away for uh, you know a holiday or we, we go visit friends or we go to a trial and that dog has, has diarrhea the whole weekend. Or he won't eat well, so we have to bring the tins of the special food. 
to tempt his appetite. Like, that's already telling you something. If I say I took my grandson to Disneyland and he had diarrhea the whole time because that's how he gets when I take him new places, you're like, oh. And it's like, yeah, he didn't also drink much. He only drank chocolate milk. And then he only ate graham crackers, but only at night when all the lights were out. You're like, oh, we had a great vacation. It was wonderful. You're thinking, I don't know that that sounds like it was actually fun for the child. <laughs> it's like, yeah, he didn't really sleep much either. You know, I'd wake up and he'd be pacing around, but we really had a great time. And he refused to, you know, it's like, what? So we look at urination, defecation, drinking, eating, sleep and rest, pain and mobility. And so all those are scaled. It's a very simple set of questions that as you take them, it then scales them for you. So it'll be green. Everything's pretty good. You know, if it's in the bottom of the green range, it's like pay attention. You might want to, for perfection, help the animal. Yellow is going to say there's a need that has to be met or the quality of life can be compromised here. And then the red says you have a, you have a problem that has to be addressed. And even if addressed, this may not work. So physiological, then we do cognitive, we do um, learning, performance or work um, and play because learning is about one aspect of cognition. Work and performance is about executing known tasks and then play and then social. And we want to know how is the dog with familiar people, unfamiliar people, familiar dogs, unfamiliar dogs, and in the absence of the preferred person. So you can imagine, yep, you can imagine where <clears throat> we could easily find out that as we put in that the dog is not eating all of his food and he's got diarrhea and he's not drinking and he's not sleeping well, we're going to see a lot of, of yellows and, and reds and that puts us on notice. So in a shelter setting like at the Dogs Trust, it's like, uh, is this dog step back to carrot is this dog actually very auditory or the noise is bothering him can we move him to a quieter kennel can we put him in someone's office can we not house him next to that that crazy dog there who's threatening him all day and then this actually helps you track progress so if you were adding a new regimen whether that was behaviorally um medication food exercise training plans you could actually see are we getting somewhere? Are we helping this animal be more functional? And so for like the Romanian street dogs you're talking about, when we did this, we might actually see that for a lot of things, like for, for many of those street type, island type dogs I see, they don't sleep well because their their sleep's disrupted because there's noises, there's all the household stuff. Um, they're not actually getting the sleep that they need. So yeah, it ends up coming out looking like that and that actually was my dog uh, about two months before he died so it would at a glance tell you and you can the gray means that it wasn't scaled so that if you were taking a dog in let's say for boarding and training you have the owner fill that out and know if you were going to be a pet sitter it's like let's let's have the owner fill that out so that we can take a look at that and they become discussion points it's like hmm Tell me about this here. What what's what's going on? What is what's the urination thing? It's like, oh, you know, I mean it's a funny story, but a sad story. A pet sitter was walking a new client. So she takes this poor golden for a almost two hour walk, waiting for him to, to pee and poop, and he will do neither. And she's running out of time. She has to go to the next client. And so she calls the owner and says, I'm really, really sorry. I'll deal with the other dog and I will come back and I'll walk him again. She goes, Oh no, 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 no. He only pees and poops in the front yard. So the poor dog had been waiting patiently, hoping to God he could be relieved. And meanwhile, the poor pet sitter, because no one told her that. But fat would account for that. So you'd actually know what this dog's quirks were, what interrupted him, what affected his functionality. Um, but I think it's going to be very useful for vets and professionals tracking how the changes go. So, yep, and you can see there it's shifted to red. If you scroll back down, it went that was that was the change in just a couple of days. You scroll back up, what was it, a few days? The 12th and only three days later, he's already, things that were green, that were functioning okay, were beginning to deteriorate.
and it can go the other happy way too. <laughs> so, yep, it's going to, I think it's going to be a fabulous tool. Um, and you know, the, those famous words, how's he doing? He's fine. Yes. Fat takes, he's fine. Throws it out the window because how's he eating? Fine. And it turns out that means as long as I sit on the floor and I have a tin food and I put some cheese on every bite and I beg him, please, Please eat for mommy. Meanwhile, the vet's like, oh, he's eating well. He's seeing a dog like, nom, nom, nom. Yeah. It's like, he's not eating well? Ah, but fat accounts for all that because the, the, the person doing the assessment gets to just pick off. What, is, what do they see? What's actually happening? What do you observe? And then it automatically, the software scales it for them and presents them with the report. You can email it. You can download it. You can give access. So if you were a trainer, you could give access to your clients to your fat portal and then say, oh, Mrs. Smith. So since last time, it looks like Bosco's, he's eating better now and he's sleeping better. So did that crate rest in the afternoon with the white noise machine and making sure he didn't have to deal with that. Oh, that is helping. Good. He's more functional. When does that go live, Suzanne? Is that something we can use? Uh, yeah, if you're on my mailing list, you'll know. Um, that should be out and about in beta version by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, Great. Years, years in the making. It's a very complex thing. Yeah. Because yeah. There's multiple causality, doesn't it? There's just so many factors. And when you take a behavior case, it's even if somebody contacts you about, you know, kind of barking or pulling and lead, there's just so many factors that underpin behavior. That we need these, these tools to be able to be precise, don't we? Yeah, and it's it's no matter how good you are and how experienced you are, remembering to like go through every single thing because sometimes they'll say something and I'm in my head. I drive off the road all the time because I saw something shiny. So they'll say something about the dog's behavior, and I'm like, let's go there and talk about that for ten minutes. And then I think I remember to ask about them. So this actually guides the owners also. Um, and then what I've had other people, because we've had some beta versions out there, it helped train their staff because the staff that didn't understand that was valuable. Like, oh, I wouldn't even thought to look at that. And now I know to look for that. It can also be split up so that like uh, at the Dogs Trust, those of you dealing with behavior you can just be the ones who do the input on the cognitive and social. The folks in the back who are doing the, the husbandry, they can be the ones entering just the physiological. They're the ones seeing the dog's eating behavior and what his poop looks like and all that stuff. Sure. And then as a whole, you get the picture. Mm -hmm. well, I guess in the interim, uh, people can check out uh, Dr. Susan Friedman's FADE form, which is a, a similar sort of version, I would imagine. It's a functional assessment intervention design. And it's got a great structure to be able to follow. I use that every single day. And it looks like it's on a similar kind of vein. And uh, we need these tools. They are they're so important. And, and I think you made a point there about you know, kind of going off on tangents with clients and trying to cover really complex areas. And you know, you're trying to be quite structured about it, but that conversation can go off in, in, in tangents so easily. I think these tools help us be precise in terms of underlying issues. Is that fair to say? Yep. That would take the, the handler maybe, you know, you could go through it with them. Or they can go through it, with, you know, ahead of time and submit it to you, and you can see it in the portal. Um, maybe 15 minutes, but then it gives you all the talking points because it doesn't just show you the color; it shows you all the specifics that went into that score. So that could be highly individual, but yeah. So now you've got your talking points, and I don't know about in the UK, but certainly here in the states, the pandemic has meant that vets are chatting with their clients mostly through a car window yeah. in the parking lot of the vets and that is not conducive to getting good information um it's not so i'm i'm really excited i think this can really make it. and if i was going to be asked to board a dog i want i want that filled in before i take him and then i can ask the employees depending on how long he stays and i can also then give him a report to the client like he's he's doing fine he's doing great or we have a problem. What would you like us to do about it? But covers the professionals, but by saying this is where the dog was when we started with him. But I think being able to track medication changes and behavior changes, yeah. really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks fantastic. So end, end of the year, you reckon it will be, be sort of up, up and running? And how much work has went into that? Is that kind of years in the making by, by the looks of it in terms of its complexity? That started in 2015. Wow. wow. Well, Carrot, Carrot's been around since 2007. 
Um, and I've just kept it pretty much under my belt. But uh, yeah, fat, rat, carrot, these, it's just like this whole suite of assessment tools that really can, um, I think, just help us understand dogs better. And when we, when we understand better, then we have the, that beautiful luxury of making a really informed choice, making a great choice. No one gets up on purpose and says, I hope I can screw this animal up today. But if we don't even know something should be on our radar, this is why we pay professionals with a lot of experience because their, their radar covers a whole lot more. <laughs> That's it. The fat carrot rat. Mm, they're all pretty much my radar all written down on paper. Someone once asked me that, could you just write down everything you think about when you look at an animal? And I said, I can, but it's going to take a lot of paper. I was right. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a great tool. And I look forward to that coming out and, and I appreciate we're sort of coming up to, to an hour and a half, uh, Suzanne, and I could talk to you for, for hours and you've been very generous and kind with, with your time. And I really appreciate you coming on. There was a lovely comment in the comment section, which I'll just uh, bring up, which, yeah, I think I think you'll like if you can if you can read that. Okay, the range quite small. Oh, nice. Yeah, just a lovely comment, and, and I totally agree with that. Your examples are, are great, and they're rooted in real life too. And it's really quite easy to be theoretical about what we talk about with a lot of jargon, and I think you you cut through that um, so so well. Um, so so I, I'll thank you for your time. I think we've covered a lot today, and um, I really look forward to that coming out. I think that'll be a valuable tool for for all of us. So, so, so thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you doing this. And, uh, and I think we'll, we'll sort of come to a natural conclusion there if you're okay with that, uh, Suzanne. Yeah, that's great. great and in the comment section, you know, show Suzanne the love that she deserves. Um, she's very keen to do this. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. And a pleasure to meet you, Jim. And I hope it's not the last.